uh, bill introductions. Anyone have any bill introductions? Seeing none. We will open up the hearing on House Bill 2541, crediting docket fees to the State General Fund instead of Judicial Branch docket fee fund, and crediting marriage license fees, driver's license reinstatement fees, and the State General to the State General Fund instead of the Judicial Branch non-judicial salary adjustment fund. We'll start out with a overview from the reviser, Jill Walters. Welcome committee, Jill. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Feels good to be back. I've missed you guys. So I'm gonna start with currently the docket fees and the other additional fees, and those are typically referred to as the surcharge. Those are credited to the judicial branch docket fee fund, the judicial branch non-judicial salary adjustment fund, and the judicial branch non-judicial salary initiative fund as provided by statute. So in there, those percentages there that go into those funds. And then a portion of the marriage license fees and driver's license reinstatement fees are credited to the judicial branch non-judicial salary adjustment fund. And so pursuant to the bill, those docket fees, the other additional fees and the portions of the marriage license fees and driver's license reinstatement fees would be credited to the state general fund. So instead of going into a special revenue fund, that the judicial branch could then use, they would go into the state general fund. The House voted favorably on the bill, 111 to 12 on March 16th, and if enacted, the bill would take effect on publication in the statute book. And I would be pleased to answer any questions. Any questions for Jill? Senator Hawk. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Who sets the docket fees in each of those areas? Is that strictly up to the court, or is there some other process? For They're set by statute, sir. So the legislature has to uh, enact new statutes if we raise those fees? You would update the current statute, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Other questions for Jill? Seeing none, thank you, Jill. Thank you, sir. Next, we'll have uh, proponents, the Chief Justice Marla Lukert from the Kansas Supreme Court. Welcome to the committee. Chief Justice. Thank you, Senator Billinger. Members of the committee, well, first, happy spring. Nice to be here on the second day of spring. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. First, I would like to express my gratitude and uh, that of all Judicial Branch employees for the action you've taken so far in this session. Uh, we appreciate your support for our budget enhancement request and for including us in the 5% COLA. Last year, you committed to bringing our employees to market in two years. That was based on market that was calculated in the summer of 2020. So we're already two years out from that calculation. And as each of us has felt in our pocketbooks, I'm sure, we've experienced inflation in that two years and the competitive market forces of the labor market have made it difficult to stay competitive. So that 5% will not only help our employees and judges, but it will further your and my joint goal of attracting the best employees we can to do the technical work in our clerk's offices and our court service officers and other places. Work that can impact Kansans' lives, property, and even their liberty. So thank you from me personally and from those on the, uh, in the judicial branch. As for today's agenda, thank you, Chairman Billinger, for hearing this bill so quickly. And we, uh, after it moved through the House, we appreciate your consideration and urge you to support the enactment of House Bill 2541. As Ms. Walters has explained, what we're talking about here is a structural change in judicial branch funding but it is not intended to change the amount budgeted in either the judicial branches fund or in the state general fund, other than to increase the, the amount um, of fees flowing from one place or the other. The bill would shift the deposit of the judicial branches share of those court user fees that she outlined. And they would shift from the judicial branch funds to the state general fund. 
House Bill 2541 would not change the fact that we are using those funds to fund core services in the judicial branch. This would allow those funds to still be available for you to use to fund those core operations. It would just simply shift the fund from which it comes. To explain with a little more specificity, the source of about 80% of the judicial branch's core functions and operations come right now from the state general fund. The state treasurer deposits uh, the great majority of docket fees and a portion of marriage license and driver's license fees into a fund that it provides a chunk, at least, of that other percentage. Of, and under 2541, rather than for that chunk to go to those funds in the judicial branch, we would request that that go into the state general fund to offset the judicial branch's loss of those funds. We would then ask you to appropriate state general funds in, in the amount that we would project to be generated from those docket fees and other fees. I do want to point out that other agencies also receive for portions of the fees from marriage licenses and driver's license reinstatements. And the Judicial Council receives those fees plus a portion of docket fees. The reason I point that out is to make it clear that this bill does not impact those agencies or their income flow. Um, this is only changing the way this funds the judicial branch. The purpose of asking for this shift is to insulate us from the volatility of these various funds. As I've noted, it, it's an in, not an insignificant part of our budget that comes from these. And those funds, we have learned historically, vary month to month, season to season. And that can cause cash flow problems. So throughout the year, we have to consider whether to delay filling positions because of the fund balances. Almost all of that money being used to fund employee salaries. Usually by the end of the year, that's all worked out, and the amount of fees that have flowed in are the amount that we predicted for the fiscal year. It's just the fluctuations along the way that cause operational difficulties. And because they usually come out where we have projected, it means that in most years we, have, we would be proposing a net neutral exchange or possibly even a positive gain for the state general fund. But I have to be clear, that, and as, we, as you well know, there are times that that income falls below projections, and we saw that in fiscal years 20 and 21. During that time, we experienced a $7.4 million deficit from projections. Faced with that deficit and the reality that 90% of our state budget pays salaries, the Kansas Supreme Court had to drastically cut payroll expenses. Now let me be clear, there was never a day that cases couldn't be filed in our court. With electronic filing, cases can be filed 365 days a year, and that didn't change during the pandemic. Despite the ability of the procedural, the procedural access to be able to file, case filings dropped off dramatically. For example, a good chunk of our filing docket fees come from traffic fines. With fewer cars on the road during the pandemic or the early months of the pandemic at least, law enforcement wrote fewer tickets and left us with a significant hole just from that alone. Left with cutting payroll in the late spring of 2020, we imposed a general statewide hiring freeze. By the fall, we had to lift that. We called it thawing the freeze because we didn't lift the freeze entirely, but we had to start looking at the points where it was becoming crippling. Where, and we set a standard that if a vacancy rate in a district fell below 25%, we would fill at least some positions. 14 of our 31 districts hit that threshold, often not just once, but multiple times during the months that this 
thawed freeze was in place. It got so bad that I found myself driving down the highway, seeing a highway patrol officer with a car on the shoulder and going, yes, another docket fee is coming in. <laughs> One could assume that since the docket fees decreased, we didn't need as many employees, and so that we could absorb that thaw or that freeze on our hiring. But what we actually experienced was the need for that staff and perhaps more. That was in large part because of the efforts we took for public health measures to spread out the number of people coming into the courthouse and to decrease the number that were there at one time. That meant instead of having staff come in to do one large docket with, say, 75 cases, we were setting those 75 cases throughout the period, um, and that just required more staff time to help the judge. Courts also modified jury selection processes. So we were using arenas, livestock buildings at the fairgrounds, theaters, high school auditoriums. And we were, or we were bringing people in in smaller groups. Both of those required more manpower to either prepare the offsite areas or to bring in all those small groups. We adopted a hands on, all hands on deck approach to handling that issue. So we had people from one district traveling to another district if there was going to be a jury trial. We even had people from our state office of judicial administrator. Uh, administration, including our deputy state administrator, who drove several hours one way to help with the jury trial. We managed to end that hiring freeze and all of those problems when you appropriated that $7.4 million of lost revenue. And again, as I've told you many times, we are so thankful for your support in doing that. This was not a Kansas-specific phenomenon. Nationwide, Courts saw dramatic decreases in filed cases. While we never hope to have a situation where we see that drastic of a drop again, we still have that risk at least. And we constantly, as I've already mentioned, deal with the smaller fluctuations and the volatility of this fund. What the pandemic did really was change our um, what had before been a goal to ask for this structural change to become a priority to ask because we really felt the crunch and we knew that you recognized at this time the crunch. But again, I'll emphasize that even before that, we, we had to deal with these fluctuations. So replacing our funds with the state general fund would provide the judicial branch better stability and predictability in its income. While these ups and downs will now be shifted to the state general fund, we believe that the size of that fund and the diversity of income sources that flow into that fund will minimize the impact of it for the state as a whole, especially as compared to the effects it has had on the much, 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 much smaller little fraction that the judicial branch is. And again, we expect in most years that that impact on the state general fund will be neutral. So with that, I will thank you for your consideration of this measure, ask for your speedy handling of it so that we can um, accomplish this goal this session, and I stand ready to answer any questions uh, that you might have for me. Thank you, uh, Justice Lukert. Uh, so you'd mentioned that uh, in a normal year, uh, there may be just a little more or just a little less, but most generally you're pretty much right on budget and it, it wouldn't vary very much. Is that That's correct? true, yeah. It's very little. Occasionally we'd get a note from the CFO that we could maybe buy more paper, stock up on paper or, you know, uh, make a little purchase here or there. But, I mean, I'm t we're talking minimal um, types of things. So a few thousand, a few tens of thousands of dollars usually. Well, and I think the main thing that, that, that I understand through the whole process is it allows you flexibility. So you, you know, month to month that you have the uh, funds available without exactly. worrying about the ups and downs. Are there other questions? Senator Hawk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, uh, Judge Lukert, thank you for your service as Chief 
Justice and for uh, getting this proposal to us. It makes good sense to me. I had a couple questions on fiscal note. I wanted to make sure. Uh, it looks like it's about a $29.4 million uh, switch in the budget in terms of moving it. And from what the chairman just asked you, we think that's going to be largely what it will be uh, most years. Yes. Yes, it would be. The um, What we would anticipate is that we would work with um, our, with our staff would work with the legislative staff to work to put in place those projections or to pr present to them the projections so that that number could be known each year. Good. And then uh, there's one thing I'm not clear about from the, the uh, fiscal note. It's talking about, uh, it says all docket fees are credited to the judicial branch docket fee fund with the exception of the 1.5 million to the electronic filing and management fund. Um, so is is that being credited also to that docket fee fund or is it just part of that or does that go somewhere else? That goes somewhere else. There's a separate fund for that. And there's specific language in the bill and and unfortunately I did not bring the bill and the bill with me. Perhaps Ms. Walters or someone else can point us to the specific lines. Thank you so much where that has been accommodated. Um, of course, I'm not finding it quickly. Um, but it is, there is a, there is language that reserves that money that goes into that technology fund. Um, so it is separated from the flow of the rest of this. So that's not part of it, okay. It is not, oh, I'm finding it now. It is um, on um, section 3E, page five of the bill, lines seven through 10, it looks like. Thank you for clarifying that. I was just curious about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you, uh, Chief Justice Lukert. Appreciate you. you being here today. Thank you very much. Committee, I would also uh, point out we have written only from uh, Chief Judge uh, Kim Kudney uh, from the Kansas District Judges Association and Judge Jennifer Ashford, Kansas District Magistrate uh, Judge Association. Are there any opponents? Seeing none, anyone here neutral? Seeing none. We will uh, close our hearing on uh, HB 2541. The chair recognizes Senator Clays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee recommend House Bill 2541 favorably. I have a motion. We have a second. Senator Hawk seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Uh, committee, uh, I'd like to uh, move on to our uh, GBA that we talked about at the last meeting, and I'd like to recognize Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to come to our attention that, that uh, in our budget, we also have several items that deal with housing, and there are several um, Proposals. I know that uh, one we had twenty million dollars in in there for housing on a bill that was passed out of Fed and State. Uh, this GBA adds another fifty million dollars. There's some question whether or not that could be spark funding. Also, we don't know that. I think, uh, Nancy, do we have a deal to pass out? We have a, a proposed amendment to be passed out or change in that. So what, what uh, the governor's GBA was for $50 million. Uh, there's a question whether that could be spark funding or not. And so 
what I would like to do would be move that uh, the committee adopt the governor's budget amendment, uh, amendment with this proviso that uh, $50 million would be appropriate to the Kansas Housing Resource Corporation Trust Fund for implementation of the rural housing projects and infrastructure development. That's a total of 50. So the 20 million that we have in the budget now and 30 million uh, of the governor's budget uh, amendment would then be make a total of $50 million. And that um, the KHRC work with the interested parties to develop a criteria. There was some concern uh, about who qualified. Uh, we heard uh, that Lenexa could qualify for rural housing. I think that I would like to have uh, the committee come back and develop a criteria for prioritization of the funding and uh, get back with us as soon as possible back with the committee. And then if SPARC funds are available or approved, that we use that. Uh, if they're approved in an amount of less than $50 million, then this amendment would be removed from consideration. If SPARC funds are approved in the amount less than $50 million, this amendment may be modified to an amount necessary to provide $50 million. So the total would be $50 million, SPARC funds uh, to be used if at all possible. And with that, questions. Any questions for Senator Alley? Uh, Senator Hawk. Uh, uh, excuse me, we have a second by Senator Clay's now question. Senator Hawk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, with the, the governor's GBA, we would have had a total of $70 million available with the 20 that was in the budget, the, and you're essentially cutting that back to 50. 30 in the governor's GBA and the 20 there, a total of $50 million. But if, if we had just approved the GBA as submitted, we would have had 70 million total, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and uh, then the other question I have, and I don't know that any of us could answer that, but uh, I know I'm on the connectivity uh, committee and I think we had our last meeting, maybe not, but, uh, and I know the other groups were meeting too. Do we have any kind of a guesstimate as to when the SPARC committee will make its recommendations for funding so we might know? My understanding, it's uh, the 25th of this month. So uh, we should easily then know by the time we do omnibus uh, where we sit with Spark. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Other questions? Senator Petty? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to confirm what I just heard. So, uh, Senator Alley, your understanding is that as of the 25th of March, the SPARC committees will be making their, all of the SPARC committees will be making their recommendations? I can't answer what the, but my understanding is that they sh they are going to meet again on the 25th, and this item would be on the agenda, I'm pretty sure. Senator Petty. They being the, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the titles for each one of those SPARC committees, but they, on the ones dealing with housing, would be meeting again on the 25th. That was what I was, uh, that's my understanding as of today. Thank you. And this will give us a position going into Omnibus with the, with the House to Senator Clays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think we should be prepared for the eventuality that this is, is not SPARC eligible because each of these projects is evaluated <clears throat> based on the SPARC criteria and it would be difficult for a program to meet the qualifications because if you dig into the spark require i mean i say spark but it's really the federal law requirements um they will allow for things in in the realm of in infrastructure like water sewer and some of those utility type items but they don't necessarily allow for the vertical construction and it is it is that construction that can then be qualified based on economic development grounds and it would be difficult to say that every rural housing development project qualifies under those those grounds. So it it may be that we are we are really looking at SGF on this, and I think it's a more responsible spend at this time at 50 million total uh, for that amount. And of course, as the uh, senator mentioned, it does make sense to have a differing position than the House going into conference, so that we can talk about all of the uh, housing 
type items at the same time. There are many that are in the Spark Committee right now that deal with housing. In fact, it's the number one issue in the Economic Development Panel. Um, there is this item. There's been some discussions of creating some low interest loan programs. So it would be wise to look at all of this at the same time as opposed to these one-offs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions, Senator Hawk. Uh, uh, actually, not a question. Uh, when I uh, uh, heard the report that we had last week uh, on this GBA uh, from the group that had looked at even what it might take to do 1%, uh, and I'm trying to recall what that amount was, but it was in excess of $100 million, and I think that only got at 1% of the housing need. I, I just uh, would like the group to know that uh, I'm comfortable with 70 million as a total figure, knowing what uh, is really a critical need in our in our rural housing. I I don't quarrel with the intent of this, and I certainly don't quarrel with. Hopefully, we could get some spark money. I agree with the senator from Celine that that may not be very likely, and we should be prepared for it. But I I would hope uh, as we get some additional information that when we get to omnibus that. We might want to increase that. I'm, I'm happy to negotiate this with the House, but uh, I think having the full $70 million could be really critical for us getting the manpower we know we're going to need for the economic development that we've already got going. And um, I think the need's far greater than $50 million and it's far greater than $70 million. So, um, you know, I'd go along with doing this, but I hope we keep an open mind. And if we get to omnibus, I think we may find out that we might want to really keep that original $20 million the governor had in there and, and support this $50 million too. Other questions? Senator Alley? I, uh, thank you. I do appreciate the good, good Senator's comments. And I uh, also want to remind him that uh, the House put $70 million in there. This would be the Senate position. We can negotiate that at that time. Yes, and I, I might just mention, too, that, uh, you know, the, one of the big concerns that I've been hearing is, you know, uh, the ending balance. And uh, there's some concern, you know, that we make sure that we have sufficient funds left. And I think our budget, when we passed it out, was at 350, 60 million uh, ending balance. And um, I, I might also mention that uh, another option that we can look at, too, is, uh, you know, as far as funding, um, maybe we look at, you know, the commerce grants. There's um, extra money over there that we maybe can shift around where we don't impact the bottom line SGF. And I think that's been a concern for many of the, the members is impacting that uh, ending balance. So I think we have a few other options. Like I said, I, I know that uh, uh, some of the grants that went to commerce or some, some other funds there we could shift around too. So other questions, Senator Hawk? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I almost thought there I had your agreement on maybe we shouldn't have put that uh, full amount of billion dollars into capers and maybe that full 80 million into our lakes and reservoirs. But uh, I, I would hope we might look at several decisions we maybe have previously made when we get to omnibus. And um, for me, I certainly put housing needs a, a little bit higher up there. And uh, the other thing I want to confess to is I sure hate it when I like the House position better than the Senate position. Thank you. And I, I know I'll get a chance to repeat that to the chair as we move through the whole conference process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you almost agreed with me there, and I think I could have twisted your arm, basically. Thank you. Other questions? Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Also in that GBA from the government, what we did have a KBI uh, GBA, and I think that, that uh, we would like to include that portion of it uh, with that motion, and so I will uh, include that. We have a second. Senator Clay is okay with the second on that? Okay. We just want to make sure, because there was two parts to the GBA that we include uh, both in there. So any other questions? See, Senator Petty. So, so, so on this um, motion that's on the floor, it now has been a minute to include the um, full amount that was 
uh, requested by the KBI. Correct. Thank you. Right, it's just one budget amendment, but it's all in inclusive, yeah. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, I'd like to also mention committee that uh, a couple of folks have asked me about uh, when we're gonna return uh, after uh, the uh, adjournment. Uh, April 21st is when we're going to try to meet back here on the 21st and 22nd if uh, for updates on the consensus revenues. So that'd be the 21st, 22nd of April. Any questions on that? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know yet. I just figured out a day finally, Tom. <laughs> Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, we are adjourned. Hey, oh, one other thing, committee. Uh, we may, uh, we, we got a bill late. Well, I guess we got it today. So it was from late last week that we may have to have a short meeting on an, another bill that uh, we need to get uh, attention to. So just a heads up. Thank you. We're adjourned.